Today's topic I'm going to delve into is going to be money because money is always a huge issue in everyone's life and most people think that if they had an endless supply of it that they'd be free and that they would enjoy life but you know deep down we all know that's not true. So I'm going to show methods that can be used to control my finances and keep the most amount of money in my back pocket later in the show. So the first thing I'd like to do is get the definition, the legal definition of money. So money from Black's Law. <coughs> in usual and ordinary acceptation, it means gold, silver, or paper money. And when they say paper money, what they're really referring to there is paper money that represents gold and silver. Because if you have a paper note that says pay to the bearer upon demand in gold and silver, which is what it used to say in 1913, then that paper money represents gold and silver. Used as circulating medium of exchange, but does not embrace notes, bonds, evidences of debt, or other personal or real estate. Lane versus Riley, 280 Kentucky. So when it says it does not embrace a note, let's, uh, let's zoom in on what this is. See where it says at the top there, it's a Federal Reserve note. A note is a promise to pay. So this is a promise to pay, but when? When will the Federal Reserve who issued the promise, because it's their promise, when will the Federal Reserve who issued this promise ever redeem it in gold and silver or lawful money? The answer to that is never. There are three different forms of money. The first is true money, which is money that has intrinsic value, which is often gold and silver, but it could be <coughs> cigarettes, salt, alcohol, or anything treasured by everyone or by the person you're trading with. The second form is fiduciary money, which is something that can be exchanged for real money, such as pieces of paper that would say, pay to the bearer one ounce of gold on demand. A can of beans or a two by four piece of wood has intrinsic value, which means I can't, it can't lose its immediate value and it costs something to replace it. The replacement costs are what the value is going to be because if you can replace it for less than what its value is, then the person who's doing all the replacing could get rich, right? The standard form of fiduciary money would be paper money or a check or a promise to pay that gives you a right to exchange it for real value, like gold. The third form of money is fiat money, which is something with no intrinsic value and cannot be exchanged for anything of intrinsic value by the creator of the money. Its replacement cost is nothing or almost nothing. It only has value if someone accepts it as having value. Fiat money is not backed by anything of value. You cannot exchange it for anything of value like gold by the party who issued it, which is always a government or private bank enforced by the government. I mean, if the government didn't enforce the fact that you had to take uh, Federal Reserve notes, wouldn't you rather get paid in silver dollars? The government gives nothing of value for it and creates a need for the use of the fiat money by making it acceptable for the payment of taxes, etc. The government issuing it will generally outlaw the use of real money because, hey, there's no competition like gold so that people won't demand gold for payment of any debts owed them as no one would prefer paper to gold at some point. And I think we've reached that point. Since there is no hesitancy and bar to issuing large amounts of new money, the paper eventually loses value. And people would clamor for gold, which never loses value if, it, if they could demand it. Money is a medium of exchange that itself has value. What value does an ounce of gold have? Certainly it has the value someone can assign to it, like a collector assigns a value to a rare baseball card. But it also has intrinsic value, 
and that would be the replacement cost of the ounce of gold. How much does it cost to dig it out of the ground, separate it from the rock it's bound in, and mint it into a stamped coin? All these things cost money, or labor. Now let's look at what we accept as money today. Pieces of paper with green ink on them. Do they have any intrinsic value? Yet they cost less than two cents to print and are composed of cotton, fi uh, cotton fibers with special inks. If any man started printing bills of credit, which is what Federal Reserve notes are, and circulating them as money, how long would it take for him to become the richest man in America? The answer is, the answer would be however long it would take to run the printing presses to produce $100 bills in such quantities to surpass the previous richest man in America. As people who need to exchange what they produce for items they need or desire, a medium of exchange is necessary or at least preferable. Gold and silver is very heavy and susceptible to robbery as there's no way of determining whose wealth it is once it's stolen. In comes the moneylender to the rescue with his large safe and strong box to protect and store your gold and to hand out receipts to be exchanged for the real gold when presented for payment. In the meantime, the goldsmith moneylender starts loaning out your gold at interest to other people because he realized that everyone storing gold is never going to ask for their gold all at the same time, so he can safely loan out, say, 90% of the gold and still satisfy the few requests for the real gold presented to him. Next, the Federal Reserve, who originally handed out green paper receipts redeemable in gold from 1913 to 1930, handed out so many gold receipts without gold to back them up that when the country went bankrupt in 1933 to the federal government, it was forced to remove gold as a medium of exchange. And the federal government stepped in, FDR stepped in, and demanded every citizen of the United States turn in their gold to the Fed, thus removing it from the possibility of its superior position as legal tender. So here's FDR's order, executive order of the president. This was actually posted in 1933, as you can see. All persons are required to deliver on or before May 1st, 1933, all gold coin, gold bullion, and gold certificates now owned by them. Wait a minute. The president is ordering people to give their private property to the government? I mean, the government is the servant of the people, and here we have an executive order stating that the people now have to turn their gold into the government. Interesting, huh? And then we have what I was showing you before, how this is what an example of a, it says pay to the bearer on demand here at the bottom in gold coin. So what are you going to pay to the bearer on demand? You're going to give them, you're going to take this to the bank and the bank is going to give you a $20 gold piece, which at the time was an ounce of gold. So. So the U.S. Constitution in Article 1, Section 8, under the powers granted to Congress, states to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and of foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures. In Article 1, Section 10, under the powers forbidden to the states, let's take a look at that. Here is the Constitution, Article 1, Section 10, and we read here, no state shall enter in any treaty, alliance, or confederation, grant letters of mark, and reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit. What's that? Paper money. Make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. Okay, since this has never been um, repealed and there's been no amendment to change that, then they're violating the Constitution when they, when they say that you can't demand to be paid in gold and silver. So constitutionally, the federal government made it impossible for anyone to, make a, to pay a debt because they took away the means to pay the debt. If you can't pay in gold and silver, then you can't pay a debt, so that means you would be a debtor forever. Since gold and silver no longer existed as a possibility for payment, the states immediately became dormant and de facto, or of fact, instead of de jure of law or of the law and became subsidiaries of the federal government. 
USA Incorporated, United States Incorporated. What I'm saying there is that if, let's say, somebody works for the, for the state, if the state can't pay its sa the salary of that party in gold and silver, then they, and they ha don't have the ability to pay in gold and silver, then they then they're ceased to be in the Republic of California. Right? This was treason, as Franklin Delano Roosevelt had no authority whatsoever to cancel the Constitution and give the United States Corporation over to the Federal Reserve in bankruptcy. How can you go bankrupt to a foreign corporation? The Fed, who never gave you anything of value in the first place, there's never been any lawful consideration, i.e. gold or silver, given by the Fed to the government. And the, since the Fed has never been audited, because they are a foreign corporation, and foreign corporations don't have to divulge anything, they've only issued credit or worthless paper, and no debt is, has ever existed that has been um, created by the Federal Reserve. Let's look at the legal definition from this law society, the group of lawyers who made their own society, of which we never joined, but feels it's their duty to rule over us with their chosen words, which sound like English, but we do not know the meaning of for. This is right out of Black's Law. So, credit, the ability of a businessman to borrow money or obtain goods on time in consequence of the favorable opinion held by the community or by the particular lender as to his solvency and reliability. Now, when it says borrow money, a businessman to borrow money, we looked up at the definition of money, and money is gold and silver or paper that can be exchanged for gold and silver. So does a bank have the authority to lend credit when it's not gold and silver? Nope. So if we are a businessman and a favorable opinion of, by the community of our character, the bank may lend us credit without collateral to guarantee it. How about the legal definition of debt? And here we have the Black's Law definition. Debt, a sum of money. Once again, there's that term money. And since money can only be gold and silver or paper that can be exchanged for gold and silver, due by certain and expressed agreement as by bond for a determinate sum a bill or note, a special bargain, or a rent reserved on a lease where the amount is fixed and specific and does not depend upon any subsequent valuation. So a debt is something that you create when you sign a promissory note. Now, if you signed a promissory note and you owed that debt, you can only owe a debt if you borrowed money. Has anybody ever borrowed money since 1933? Apparently not, because under the legal definitions, they haven't borrowed money. They've been issued bills of credit, which have no value. And if they, if you have the right to, um, if they have the right to issue a promise to pay, as the Federal Reserve does on their note, which says it's a promise to pay, it's a Federal Reserve note, a promissory note. If they have the right to issue a promissory note and pass it off as value then you have the same right to issue a promissory note. So you could take a piece of paper and say, I am giving this promissory note to the bank in favor of the bank for the amount of $350,000 and sign, date it and sign it and there you go. That's a promissory note. It has the same amount of value as the Federal Reserve notes they give you or even worse, they actually never even give you Federal Reserve notes. They give the store owner who gave you something a transfer of credits, digits on a computer screen. So can we have a debt under the Constitution if we are loaned Federal Reserve notes? No, because we did not receive any constitutionally defined legal tender or gold or silver or fiduciary money. We get alleged loans of credit, not money, and since there was nothing of consideration advanced from the com common law standpoint of substance, which is something real, we should be able to repay the paper with ink on it with our own piece of paper with ink on it. And of our making, that would be of equal value. Let's look up the legal definition of promissory note.
Okay, here's promissory note once again, right out of Black's Law. A promise or engagement in writing to pay a specified sum at a time therein limited or on demand or at sight to a person therein named or to his order or bearer. A written promise made by one or more to pay another or order or bearer at a specified time. A specific amount of money. See, there's that term again, money. Or any or other articles of value. Now, so did the um, Federal Reserve give you a promissory note? <laughs> Is the Federal Reserve note a promissory note? Yes, because it's not lawful money and it actually states it's a note right on it under Title 12, Section 411. Let's look at that. So here's Title 12. Section 411, it states, this is United States Code, Title 12, if you look it up. The said notes shall be obligations, what said notes? You know, they're not describing them. The said notes shall be obligations of the United States and shall be receivable by all national and member banks and Federal Reserve Banks for all taxes, customs, and other public dues. What they say before, the bank ensures the use of the money by making sure that you have to use it to pay taxes. They shall be redeemed. Now, what's redeemed mean? That means you can get something for it. In lawful money. What's lawful money? I mean, would that be constitutional money? Gold and silver? On demand at the Treasury Department of the United States in the city of Washington. Well, that would be a little far to take my uh, $100 bill to go get paid. But we see here, or, at the bottom, or at any Federal Reserve Bank. Well, guess what? This is from Cornell Law, by the way. All banks are Federal Reserve Banks. <laughs> They're all Federal Reserve Banks. What is lawful money? Try going to a Federal Reserve Bank and getting them to redeem your $100 bill in gold and silver coin, which is the only constitutional, lawful United States money, and they will call the police and refuse to redeem your note. Let's say you never have enough money. Where do you start? I mean, this is our major point. We're always broke and we would do better if we had more money. I'd, l I'd get a notebook out and a pencil and start with my expenses for each month. This would be the high dollar items down to the low dollar items, starting with housing, utilities, car payments, food, etc. You list all what you're going to use in the month. The rent or mortgage is usually the highest expense and it's a fixed amount. Can it be changed? Yeah. Sometimes you can find lower cost housing situation. That would or would benefit by using less space or living farther from where you have where you are now, farther away. A lot of times it won't make any difference, as perhaps the gas would amount to more than the increase in the rent or mortgage. Second on the list is usually a car with its gas expense, insurance expense, repair expense, etc. The most economical transportation is a used car worth around $4,000 that has less than 100,000 miles on it and gets high mileage. Think Toyota or Nissan or Honda. I always look for a private party sale, through, though sometimes dealers have good deals and there are advantages to using a dealer as they have more requirements placed on them to be honest in their contracts. Well, not completely true, but at least they have to have had their brakes inspected. They have to have seat belts that are functional. There's a certain amount of requirements that a dealer has that private parties don't have. And, you know, if you have a problem with the car, you're more likely to go back and resolve a problem with the dealer than you are with a private party because a private party can tell you to, you know, leave. And uh, unless you take them to court, you're not going to get any satisfaction. Then there is your weekly food, clothing, fun money, etc. When things are tight, the worst expense is money that gains nothing for you but keeps the bankers rich, such as overdraft payments, over the limit on the credit card payments, penalties for late payments on credit cards, phone bills that, you, that you're late on, etc. Add up all these useless payments that you, that you receive nothing from, 
They're just penalties. And you could have bought a TV set or a vacation to Hawaii. One easy way to fix this problem is to make sure that your credit card has a, the minimum amount withdrawn from your bank account automatically each month. You can call the credit card company. What I do is I just call them and tell them I'm refusing to pay a late charge. I'm refusing. I'm not going to pay it. And if you know if you want me to sign up for an automatic withdrawal from my bank, I'll be happy to do that. What's it going to cost you? I mean, if your bank account's uh, broke, then you know it's going to be going to be a problem all the same. But most of the time. You may have a $25 payment on your credit card that you were late on, and then, you, and then they want you to pay $25 or $30 in late fees. That's ridiculous. Whereas if you had an automatic withdrawal program, then the, auto, the amount gets automatically withdrawn from your bank account in the minimum amount. And I don't recommend paying the minimum amount. I recommend paying the credit card off if you can. Call them up and make sure that you have automatic withdrawal of the minimum amount due. The minimum payment due is usually low and it's ridiculous to pay a $30 late fee for a missed payment of $20. You end up paying the $20 anyway and now to add insult to injury they want $30 more for paying them a late fee. This is the definition of usury. Usury was banned by the church in the Middle Ages. Usury is the um, process of lend, lending money at interest. The interest is usury. So imagine what the interest is on a credit card. Maybe the credit card rate is uh, 20 percent, but if you pay a $30 late fee and the interest rate is 20, uh, the interest rate was $20 and the late fee was $30, then obviously the interest rate is more than the 20 percent. So you're talking 40 percent, and that's unlawful and yet the credit cards get away with it. Uh, governments get away with it. They came out with this idea that everything could be a, a penalty is okay. There's a maximum interest rate that you can be charged, but penalties are okay because they're not interest. Yeah, right. Penalties are not illegal to charge you f f for, and you'll notice it's only the government and government-sponsored corporations that charge them. I mean, if you have a contractor come over to your house there might be a small fee for not paying them on time, but it's nothing like the government likes to charge. If you set up the payment plan and you forget to pay the bank, the bank pays it for you. What do you save? You save the $30 late fee, a boost to a higher interest rate for late payment that could add up to plenty, etc. To make sure you have enough to cover your overdraft and automatic withdrawal at the bank, you must first set up $300 in a savings account at the bank and make sure the bank will cover overdraft from the savings account to your checking account. This is an automatic. I mean, even if you're flat broke most of the time, you have to set up $300 in a savings account and get, it to get the bank to agree to use the savings account to cover overdraft of your check writing. The object is not to go out writing checks knowing that you have $300 extra to cover them. That's not the game. The game is that $300 doesn't exist, but if for some strange reason your checking account didn't get um, you know, added to when you put your last payment check in or something like that and you write a check against it, there's something to cover the check. The banks make way too much money on the fees, overdraft checking, which is you know usually $15 to $25, and you give up your hard money to them for what? I mean, the whole point of banking when I was young was if you wrote a check and there was no money in the account, they just would give the check back to the person and tell them there's no funds. But they wouldn't charge you, and they wouldn't charge the person presenting the check. Then they got the bright idea that hey, we're going to charge more money by making people feel guilty about writing checks when they don't have the money in the bank. I would also go to a credit union instead of a bank, as I have found them to be much easier to deal with and less punitive, much less. By and large, credit, credit unions are much more user-friendly. The banks are just 
I have plenty of words I could use for banks. You say, but I can't save $300 to put into my savings account. I say, everyone can do that if that is their priority. And you should make it your priority. You have to make it priority, number one, to be able to relax and not worry about the bill collector and money. Next thing to do is to make sure you only spend the money you have. From your monthly expenses notebook, you will know that your absolute monthly outgo is. Let's say your monthly outgo is um, $1,000 or $1,200. Then you need to have $1,200 in the bank every month to cover the checks you're going to write for the rent and for the uh, PG&E and for whatever. But they have to master the approach of cash. The cash is, is, is your in the purse or in the wallet accounting system. As the system becomes more usual and normal, your savings should grow. Next, you can move on to making life easier by making better decisions about the larger expenses in your life. The car is a large expense for most people. If you wish to spend the least possible on transportation, you might be able to get away with a motor scooter where the initial cost might be $1,600 for a new one that gets 60 miles to the gallon and will take two people slowly on the freeway short distances. The real savings comes with the $100 per year insurance compared to $100 a month for insurance for a cheap car with liability only. Really cheap cars, like ones costing less than $2,000, will usually cost more in the long run, even though it seems like this is your only option. Try borrow money from dad or friends and make sure to pay them back and you'll be better off in the long run spending a little more and getting a car that won't cost you in repairs over time. Get liability insurance only as full coverage will cost you more in the long run unless you have a $50,000 Mercedes or Porsche. Once your car is paid for, your expenses go way down, but you should be putting money in your savings for the rainy day when your car blows up or gets totaled and you need to replace it. Just because you don't have a $200 a month car payment anymore, if you don't save that money in an account, when it comes time to get a new car two years later, then you'll have $4,000 saved in your car account. And you have to be very um, able to resist spending your money like that, knowing that it's there for something important. You can't spend that extra money partying. After you've got your finances more under control by paying in advance, you can pay in advance via using a Visa credit card that are available from Simon, gift mall, uh, Simon Malls' as gift cards. You can put up to $500 cash on the card and will pay no interest or monthly fees, and you can use it anywhere Visa is honored. So if you break down while you're driving and need a tow and, you're, and a tire, your credit card will save you. because. If you put $500 cash in your pocket, you're more likely to spend it, whereas if you have the credit card. The other advantage of the credit card is if you lose it, <coughs> you can cancel it. And um, as long as nobody spends any money on it, you'll be, uh, it's different than the losing uh, cash in your pocket. So you can cancel it immediately. After one year, they start charging $2.50 a month, but you can put the balance that you have on a new card, and now you have another year where you're not paying any monthly fee. To understand the beauty of this approach, you have to understand that um, having a credit card is valuable at some points. I mean, ordering things on the internet, staying at a motel room, there are places where credit card is an uh, advantage. You can put $500 on a gift card at Simon Malls, that's the main mall downtown, and they'll give you a Visa credit card. You can sign your name on the back of it, and you can sign any name on the back of it. It doesn't really matter because they don't check ID. So you could be totally anonymous with this credit card. But you can go online and sign up a name for it, and then that's the name that it's, that it's used under. So if you get to the point where you want to use a credit card 
I would recommend putting the $500 on a gift card and then that's like a little stored bank account for a rainy day. And then when it gets close to the year, if you haven't used it, transfer it to another card. The big deal here is no interest and no late charges, no over the limit charges. I mean, if you get a card that has a thousand dollar limit, they encourage you to spend more because they love to hit you with $30 over the limit charges. They don't care. They love it. You can always send them a letter. I, I'm sending you this notice. I refuse to pay over the limit charges. If you do that in advance, you have a legal standing coming back later if they start charging you. Say, I'm not paying it. You can save a lot by never getting into credit card debt. I mean, most people understand that. If you're already in credit card debt, you can get out by filing paperwork with the credit card company to make them validate the debt, which they never do as they never loaned you any money. I mean, if the credit card company is sending you letters constantly and telling you that uh, you know, you're in default and you owe all this money and we're going to take you to court and blah, 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 blah. The first and most important thing one can learn is, is that never accept what they say at face value. The old uh, maxim of law, he who fails to deny admits. So if they accuse you of something and you don't deny it, then you've admitted to it. So send them a letter back, certified mail, and say, I don't believe I owe you any money and I need you to verify the debt by somebody with first-hand knowledge, not hearsay evidence, that the credit card company loaned me money. And since I've shown you the definition of money, we all know that they never loaned you any money. They loaned you credit. Worse than that, they loaned you your own credit because it was your signature that created the money. It is far better to pay your bills, than it, and it's easier to do if you don't create needless bills in the first place. Instead of living in fear of balancing your checkbook, become the master of your checkbook. You can do it. You have the power to control your spending, and no one else cares about your finances like you do. If you believe you're entitled to everything you desire, you're not alone but you'll be joining the many who worry constantly about the landlord or the credit card company showing up at their doorstep and threatening them. Only you can stop falling for the trap of easy money put out by the credit card companies and the banks and the many other corporations who promise that you'll get it now and pay later. I mean, the Nazis studied uh, human behavior <coughs> and all of this is geared to take advantage of our frailties right? I mean, people are lazy. That's a generality, that all people are lazy. So when you send somebody a letter and say you owe money, they're lazy, they're not going to answer the letter, they're going to hide their head in the sand or throw the letter in the garbage and go, I'll deal with that later. Well, that's the incorrect way to do it. <laughs> so who wants to get go to court to defend themselves when there's nothing you can say but, yeah, yeah, I got the couch and made payments but fell behind. And then once you realize the company never gave you anything of value when they required you to give them your labor exchanged for worthless paper, you'll feel used. I mean, it's not that the couch doesn't have value, but when you gave them a promissory note and they created the funds, usually the party that gave you the couch isn't suing you. Usually there's a finance company. You check it out. It's not the store that, that you're stiffing, it's the finance company. What's a finance company? Another word for mafia. <laughs> the devil tempts us, that's his job. Our job is to resist the temptation. It's your duty to control your own finances. When you were young, we had no responsibility and we desired freedom as we, to do as we wished. As we matured, we gained freedom, but with that came responsibility. The more responsible we show, responsibility we show we have, the more freedom we gain. If I pray that I will let go and let God and give up my ego's need for gratification, things will work themselves out. I have denied myself the pleasures that most people take for granted, like having new everything, going out to dinner, going out to movies, pizzas, vacations, etc. 
but I find there is lots and lots of free and very low cost activities that make up for those things. And having money in the bank so I don't have to worry is worth more than the momentary pleasures that I would have gotten from those activities. Of course, the above is all about working with what is and adapting to the current situation. Because, in my mind, that's the place to start. One can always work towards getting a better paying job, getting a job that fulfills our needs better and makes going to work fun. Becoming self-employed is a good option if one is focused and willing to work hard and has some talent to be offered to the public. There are plenty of mo more motivational books and techniques that encourage imagination to be explored to benefit from taking risks at money-making ventures. I mean, every time you go out in a business, it's a risk. But if you go out prepared, the rewards can be substantial. However, I believe one is always best served by first getting one f one's finances soundly set up as a safe foundation and spending off hours testing the waters of self-employment. I mean, if you're a writer, you can spend your evening hours writing, sending in publications to books for approval, and do it as a part-time thing. If you want to uh, make pottery, you can do it in the evening. And then when you have items for sale, you can put them up for sale. When you start having sales, then you have a regular business where every month you're selling you know, $300 worth of pottery items. And the thing that's really holding you back is you can't give it the full-time attention you want. Then you may consider you know, it'd be worthwhile to go into it full-time. Still, there's no guarantee. But it's a lot a uh, better foundation to start from than to just decide that I'm going to give up my job and start doing pottery. You see. If things work out, you may find more happiness in doing what you feel you are destined to do than taking what you get to survive. You may be doing exactly what you are good at already, however, and sometimes it's just seeing it with the right attitude to be content and satisfied with things the way they are. I remember when I used to think I hated my job and I just really didn't want to go to work every day. Even though, you know, I got paid decently for it. I was doing auto body. And um, after thinking about it and having more time and being unemployed and whatnot, I realized that um, I went, you know, back to it. And uh, I realized that. Actually, I kind of enjoyed having the skill of being able to work on cars. And it was, I had more enjoyment of it than I previously had felt I had. So was, what's the difference? Just a shift in your attitude about how you see it. I mean, if you didn't have your job to go to anymore, there would be negative aspects that you wouldn't enjoy as life as much. So get a list out and write what you think how you would feel and how life would be different for you if you weren't going to work every day. And then maybe you'll have a, an appreciation for the fact that you actually like doing your job more than you felt you did. It's a great feeling to be content and not living in fear in regards to your finances. Money does not buy happiness, so each time I spend my money I ask myself, is this really necessary? Could I be helping others in the world survive who are worthy of my help? If I buy this, will it eventually cause me hardship by not being able to pay for the necessities I have in life? Saving your money means you worry less about not having any because you haven't spent it all. Let's face it, worrying about a debt hanging over your head is misery. Can anyone truly say having things in this material plane makes them happy? Is it, it is a joy to ride out to the beach and watch the waves roll in. Does that cost any money? It does. However, it costs a lot less to ride out there on a motor scooter where you're paying $100 per year for the required insurance than a car where you're paying $600 per year for the required minimum insurance. You also don't gain a significant difference in traveling in a new Cadillac costing $40,000 as opposed to having a used $4,000 gas-saving Toyota. 
these little things, your free will choices, make a big difference in you having control over your life in regards to money. We are under the false belief that the government is honorable and follows the laws of God, as stated everywhere. One nation under God. In God we trust. Right on the one dollar bill. Apparently the Federal Reserve God praises deceit, falsehood, usury, and theft, as they will not obey the natural law. So does God's law and nature's law and common law not apply by some special agreement with the government to the bankers? Does the common law requirements of a lawful contract not apply to the bankers? The common law rights and requirements of a lawful contract are that they must contain one, a meeting of the minds, or full disclosure, wherein both parties know what is being bargained for. I mean, you couldn't call it a legitimate agreement if one party was deceiving the other or if the other party would have backed out if he had known all the things that were inherent in signing the contract, right? So there's the meeting of the minds, full disclosure. Two, a valuable consideration is exchanged. This can be a promise to pay or give up some right, and valuable, something of value. So your signature on, as a promise to pay has value because you're really saying that you are gonna give up your future labor for something that you're getting now. Although, personally, I don't think there should be any agreements where you're giving up your future labor. <laughs> it just is a cause for slavery. But anyway, the real issue is when you start looking at credit card agreements and, for, and uh, mortgage foreclosure stuff, did the banks give anything of value? <laughs> and then three, Two wet ink signatures indicating offer and acceptance and equal commercial liability by both parties must exist for it to be a lawful contract. I mean, you have to have offer and acceptance, and if you're the only signature on there, where's their, who's making the offer, you see? It becomes basically a declaration where they gave you the paper to sign, but you're making the declaration that this is what, what's your, what you are going to do. Because there's no signature from the opposing side. And corporations are dead fictions. They don't have any hands to sign and eyes to see. A corporation, Bank of America, as a corporation is you know a bunch of papers filed in an attorney's briefcase. Can it give a loan? No, only agents of the corporation can give loans. Only a flesh and blood man can actually hand over any money, can actually engage in ideas, the exchange of ideas. The bank, the dead fiction legal entity Bank of America didn't create any paperwork. An agent created the paperwork. So if a man or woman has to create the paperwork, has to make the offer, has to put things together, then they should sign their name to it and claim responsibility, commercial liability. Because they're claiming you're creating a commercial liability when you sign. I just want to give you a heads up and show you what real money looks like. This is a, uh, a currently issued Walking Liberty silver dollar, one ounce of silver, issued by the United States government. This is an aftermarket one ounce bullion coin. Here we have our beloved President Kennedy, and here, and here, this is um, Franklin's picture, and this is the Walking Liberty, and this coin was made in 1935. There's some history, practically worn off. Anyway, real money. Now let's discuss how you can control your spending. There's never going to be enough money if you don't control your spending. I mean, you could inherit a million dollars and it wouldn't be enough because you could go out and spend a million dollars in one day and then you'd be broke again. So unless one controls how much they spend, there's no amount of money that's going to um, be able to satisfy your need for things. 
So we have to find some way to control our spending or increase the amount of money we have to spend. Every purchase can be reviewed, can't it? So we can decide whether I need this pizza and I can't live without this pizza or I can't live without going out to dinner or I can't live without going out to movies. Now I certainly can't live without food but I can go to the grocery store and the cheapest form of food is going to be whatever the cheapest form of food is but it's going to be purchased and cooked yourself. You can choose to pack a lunch every day. You don't have to buy off the, uh, the lunch wagon. You don't have to go out to lunch every day. You don't have to. Um, there's so many things we do that we don't have to do. It's just a choice on our part. Of course, you say life's not worth living unless I get to enjoy life, right? So there is a part of that that's true. So now let's, let's talk about tapping. And I, I've done this before and in a show past where we talk about doing emotional freedom technique. So as a way to lessen our desire and make that anxious desire go away. Let's say tapping is um, just doing this. Let's say I really want a Porsche really badly. So you take your hand and on the flat part here, you go, even though I really want a Porsche badly, I deeply and completely accept myself. Even though I really want a Porsche badly, I deeply and completely accept myself. Even though I really want a Porsche badly, I deeply and completely accept myself. And then you tap the points here at the eyebrow. I really want a Porsche. I'm lusting after a Porsche. I really have to have a nice bright red Porsche. But the Porsche isn't really going to make me happy. It's an illusion. I'm happy the way I am. Or maybe I'm just not happy unless I'm wanting something. So this is under the eyebrow, under the eye, excuse me. So I really want a Porsche. I really want a Porsche badly. I really want a Porsche badly. And if I don't get a Porsche, I don't know what I'll do. I won't be happy. I am happy without a Porsche. I don't need a Porsche. I'm happy that the sun's out and I can go walking and bicycling. I'm really loving life. And then you tap right here in this, um, there's two spots on either side here that are sore spots, sore points. You tap on them right, right where the clavicle is there. So even though I really want a Porsche badly, I really don't need it. And then under your um, arm, there's a, another lymph node that's sore if you rub around in there. So like right in here, there you go. I don't need a Porsche. See, and if you tap on it, it'll go away. That you know, It'll just diffuse that frantic energy. So we have to learn to accept ourselves and that nothing we get is going to make us happy. What we want is to be content. And I'm content with my life, so I don't need things. I mean, I'll always be acquiring some things and getting rid of other things, but I don't really need them to be happy. So I hope that you can find that level of contentment